tonight. And let's open with a word of prayer, and uh, I'm going to jump into Romans chapter 3. Father, we are so grateful that we have been redeemed. And Lord, it's something we're going to talk at length about tonight, Lord, that your righteousness was never compromised when your love went forth to save us from our sin. And Lord, it's the miracle of miracles and it's the unimaginable that you did for us. Just because you love us and you want to glorify yourself in redeeming a sinful mankind. And none of us deserve it, but you have graciously given us the gift of salvation. And we are so grateful. And help me to articulate that tonight and help all of us to let this theology sink deep into our hearts, Lord, that it changes the way we live every moment for the rest of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you notice tonight, we have changed the color of the slides. And we were on the dark slides for the first part of Romans. And we spent multiple weeks looking at the darkness. We looked at the depravity of man and why God's wrath is on every human being. And last week we concluded with verse 20 of Romans 3 with this section that stated, For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The, the law simply shows us how sinful we are. Again, after Paul goes through uh, several chapters showing the universal sinfulness and lostness of all people and their great need of salvation. Now will also, Paul will show us the only way for people to be brought into a right relationship with God. And we begin in verse 21, and I mentioned this last week. There, in my opinion, uh, there should have been a chapter division here uh, because Romans 3.20 finished the thought on sin. And now Paul is going to pick up how we can be made right with God. And I want to quote a couple of scholars regarding this passage of Scripture we're going to be looking at tonight and how important they are. Robert Muntz said this, It is generally acknowledged that this passage of, strict, of Scripture to be the most theologically important segment of the entire New Testament Leon Morris said this. He said, it may, be po it may possibly be the most important single paragraph ever written. And so I want us to look at this passage tonight. And I pray that it brings us further understanding for us of God's wonderful plan of salvation. And also it deepens our sense of worship and awe of God. So let's pick up with Romans chapter 3 verse 21. But now, and again, that but now is after going through all of this teaching about why we are lost without Christ. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. Again, we started chapter 3 where Paul talked about the benefits that the Jews had because they had the Old Testament Scriptures. He now is stating what that benefit really is because that Old Testament Scriptures throughout was showing us how we could be right with God without keeping the requirements of the law. And again, he clarifies this. He says, and this was promised throughout the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. And again, when we think of Moses' writing, which is the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, that is the law. So even in the law, it was clearly stated that the law would never make us right with God, that there had to be another way. And again, he is saying that all of the Old Testament Scripture points to and are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. 
And the Jews had these scriptures to point them to Jesus and the way they could be made right with God. And it wasn't through obedience to the law, which they could full, never fully keep. So Paul used the Old Testament throughout his writings, and especially in the book of Romans, to show how all of these promises were fulfilled in Christ. And he shows the continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And Paul shares how he came to know that. Because shortly after Paul was saved, he left Damascus, and we don't know really the timeline, but he went off to be by himself for quite some time. And during this journey, Paul talks about how God showed him this, and he shows it in Galatians chapter 1, where he says this, he said, I did not rush out to consult with any human being. This is after he was saved. Nor did I go to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. He didn't go talk to Peter and James and John. He said, instead I went away to Arabia. And we don't know exactly where that was. And later I returned to the city of Damascus. And so probably the best timeline is... After Paul was saved, he went away probably for several years. And uh, the best we can tell, it was at least three years. And then he returned to Damascus, and that's when you see in Acts chapter 9 the end of it. So in chapter 9 of Acts, you have a big parenthesis there that's not shown, where Paul went away. But here's the key. Here is a man who had spent his whole entire life studying the Scriptures. He was a Pharisee. And again, I mentioned this a while back. He could have quoted many portions of the Old Testament Scriptures. But as a Pharisee, he did not understand the Scriptures. And God had to open his eyes to the true meaning of Scriptures. And I think he went verse by verse through the Old Testament. And God showed him through the power of the Holy Spirit what those verses meant. And those became recorded in all of Paul's sermons and all of his teachings in the New Testament, which is about a half the New Testament. And that's why it's so important that we interpret the Old Testament with the New Testament Scriptures, not just Paul's, but all of them to have full understanding. Now Paul will actually delve into how God's righteousness is revealed through the Gospel without keeping the law. In Romans 3.22 he says, For we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who they are. Again, this is a clear and profound statement at the heart of the gospel. And it's so simple. How can we be made right with God? By placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Now again, Paul talked about faith in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, but now he's clarifying that that faith must be in Jesus Christ, and he will even expand on what that means more in this passage we're looking at. But at this point, Paul is clarifying that God's way of providing righteousness has nothing to do with human performance. It is apart from keeping the law. This verse is connected to the next one that goes back and clearly states why no human can achieve righteousness through the law. And we often quote Romans 3.23 and when we're talking about sin, but the context of it is very important. And we probably all in here could quote this verse. For everyone is sin and we fall short of God's glorious standard. But the context of it is that Paul had dealt with all of this in the first part of Romans, and now he is saying why clearly that apart from the law we must be justified, we must be made right with God. And so the first part of this verse is again stating that everyone has sinned. And it's an aorist tense verb, not that that matters to most of you here, but it's a completed action. In other words, Every one of us come out of the womb a sinner, 
and every one of us is chosen to sin, and that is a past and present tense. And so what he's saying is, there is the depths of depravity are there. And until we come to understand this, and I think this is an important part of the gospel, until we come to understand <coughs> how far we are from God's standard, we will never be saved. And again, until people understand how far they are from God's righteous standard, to be in relationship with Him, they will not accept the gift of salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. Verse 23 also deals with another aspect. The last half of this verse is present tense. And we all come short of God's glorious standard. And this is talking out about a continual action that is ongoing. In other words, our sinfulness is not just a past problem. It is a present and future problem for all of us for the remainder of our lives. To give you an example of how we fall short, it's like going out tonight into the dark where we've got a beautiful sky and we've got the stars up there and it's like us going out there and trying to grab a hold of a star. The magnitude of my hand being here to there in relation to a star is how far? minuscule beyond infantilism. And that's what it is for us to try to grasp God's glorious standard for us in our own power. And so that's what Paul is dealing with here. And then he goes from verse 23 back to expand on verse 22 and what that faith in Christ is. In verse 24 25 are really the centerpiece of what Paul is teaching in this passage. He says, Yet God, in His grace, freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Jesus Christ when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. Freedom here that he's talking about is the idea of redemption. And that's a theological term that sometimes is used in this passage. We have been redeemed. We just sang about that. We have been redeemed. And redemption would have been something that every person in the Roman Empire would have understood because of slavery. And the aspect is this, that someone would go to a slave auction or go to a slave owner and buy a slave for the purpose of setting them free. I was watching a movie about the Underground Railroad a while back, a couple of weeks ago, and the name of the movie, it's Harriet. It was a really good movie about Harriet Tubman, who was a principal person in the Underground Railroad. But one of the things that came out in the movie, which I thought was very interesting, is that the slave owners were so uh, resistant in letting the slaves grow because in oftentimes the slaves were worth more than their, their farm, their property, their estate. And so to let them go free would have meant to bankrupt them. And that came out in that movie as part of the issue. And I thought about it. It says, what if, and I don't know if it worked, but what if the North would have just sent all the money down there to purchase every slave and set them free if we would have averted the Civil War? I don't know that we would have. But again, it's all about money. And that's what the issue was with slavery. But the idea of going and buying a slave and just letting them go was a foreign idea. It was very, very seldom that that happened in the present time. But again, what God did is He freely set us free from our sin and He justified us, declared us free from sin, 
without any merit on our part. You see, people are justified only through God's free grace through Jesus Christ's death, as detailed in the next verses. We again are dealing with the legal language here of where God in a courtroom setting is declaring us not guilty in His law court. The righteous judge tells you and me we are not guilty. And again, this is a theological term that's used throughout the New Testament in being justified. And see, saving faith in Jesus Christ justifies a person. God declares them not guilty. But there's another aspect to this. There are those who are so proud that they resist free grace. I actually met a guy this week as I was sharing with him. It was somebody who claimed to be a Christian. But as I was sharing how this passage of Scripture was so important, and I asked this person, I said, the only way to be justified before God, the only way for your sin to be dealt with is through the blood of Jesus. And you know what he said? I'm not ready to do that. I want to earn it. Oswald Chambers, in my utmost for his highest, addressed this mindset of some people. He said this, regarding somebody quoting this. This is a person with that mindset. I will give my life to martyrdom. I will dedicate my life to service. I will do anything. But do not humiliate me to the level of the most hell-deserving sinner and tell me that all I have to do is accept the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Have you ever met someone like that? They're out there. And I met one this week. But see, salvation is free only if we freely accept it. Paul goes on to explain how Jesus' sacrifice accomplishes this in the next verse. He says in Romans 3.25, the first part of the verse, For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. What is free for us was not free for God. The price God paid for our redemption was immeasurable. It was His Son. A key word in this passage that is uh, translated shedded, uh, sacrificed His life twice is the word that in the Septuagint in the Old Testament is translated propitiation. And to understand this concept of propitiation we can go to the Old Testament where it's used, and it's used in regard to the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. There the Word talks about the atonement for the sin of the people, that the high priest would go into the temple in the Holy of Holies once a year and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, which underneath that was the law that they had transgressed. And by sprinkling blood on the mercy seat, they would be atoned. God would propitiate their sin for a year. He would remove their guilt till the next year. And that's the word there that it's dealing with. And it was on the day of atonement that it would happen every year for the sins of Israel. But the book of Hebrews, which again I think Paul wrote, teaches that the Old Testament sacrifices could never accomplish full atonement and how Jesus would become the only true acceptable atoning sacrifice for our sins. Look at what Hebrews 10 says in verses 1 through 5. The old system, again all of the sacrifices under the law of Moses, was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come not the good things themselves. 
the sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year. But they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped. For the worshipers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have, been disappe would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That is why Christ came into the world and He was that sacrifice. Going back to Romans with what Paul said there in Romans 3.25, people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. Jesus was our propitiation, our atoning sacrifice. He took our punishment for us. So Jesus substituted Himself for us by taking our punishment for our sin. That is what John meant when he made this declaration in the first chapter of John when he saw Jesus. He said, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And again, it's dealing with that sacrifice that Jesus was that sacrifice. So why is this necessary? Why couldn't God just overlook our sin? It's because God's wrath is upon every person because of our rebellion. And His wrath must be dealt with in a way that doesn't violate God's righteousness, which we've talked about is a major theme in the book of Romans. God cannot look the other way or just pardon sin. It must be punished. If God just forgives sin, He would violate His very character, His righteousness. But because God is holy and righteous, he must always act righteously. For God's righteousness to deal with sin, it must be punished. And only Jesus Christ, the perfect God-man, was qualified to take the punishment for everyone's sin. Otherwise, every person must be punished for their sin. Jesus met the full demands of God's righteousness that is laid out in His law. I want to go and do a little parenthesis here. We talked about this when we were looking at the moral argument for the, for the existence of God. Where there is a sense of justice in every one of us. And see, God addresses this for us as well. In that the fact that when we see injustice, when we bid it wrong, we want retribution. We want an earthly judge and we want that justice to be meted out to appease us of our wrath. And that is, in one sense, the way God is. And when a judge declares a criminal not guilty and they walk out of the courtroom, we look at that and we see this injustice of that judge and we see the, that judge just as guilty as a criminal. Have you ever seen that? It happens, unfortunately, too often today. Personally as well, when, we, when the Bible talks about us just forgiving someone who has hurt us, that's done damage to us, and it can be great damage, when that happens, the only way for that to truly take place is that we must turn that person over to the righteous judge and let him deal with it. That's what forgiveness for us is. It's not that we just ignore it, but it is turning it over to the righteous judge 
who will deal with that sin just like He's dealt with our sin. Either it will take place where Jesus will propitiate that sin, He will atone for it, or that person will be punished forever because of that sin. And it allows us to let go. It allows us to turn them over to our righteous Father who will handle it. And so when someone sins against us, we can forgive them by turning them over to God who will deal with them in His righteous way. And if we really trust God, we can let go. And I think it's a test of whether we really are trusting God. Do we really forgive people? Because Jesus said, and I think the context of it is, He said, if you don't forgive others when they've sinned against you, I won't forgive you. I think it has to do with our faith. Are we really trusting God with that situation? This atonement, however, again, does never go into effect automatically. Going back to 325, Paul said people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His blood, sacrificed His blood, shedding His sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. You see, for our part, we must believe and accept that Jesus took our punishment in order for a person to be justified before God. They must believe that Jesus took their punishment that they deserve for their sin. This is the full understanding of verse 22, where Paul said, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Is placing our faith in who Jesus is and what He did for us when He died on the cross for our sin. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who they are. So these first five verses that we've looked at tonight, give a clear and a complete teaching of how a person is made right with God. Jesus became our substitute for sin and died the death we each are guilty of before God. God justifies us, declares us not guilty when we accept Christ as our Savior from sin. This is the meaning of salvation. And through Christ's death, we see God's righteousness in dealing with sin, and we see God's love being fully exhibited. So Jesus' sacrificial death fully satisfied God's righteous demands to punish sin and fully expressed God's love for humanity by Jesus dying for us. It is only made possible for those who believe in Jesus though. And not only are we set free from the penalty of sin when we believe in Jesus, we are adopted into God's family as His children and we become His covenant people, the church. And again, going back to the illustration of somebody going to a slave auction and purchasing a slave and setting them free from slavery, but not only that, but taking that person and adopting them as their child and letting them be a part of their family. That's what God has done for us. And it's very hard for us to fully understand this. Paul now moves forward with this teaching and he goes to deal with another question. What about all the people who lived back there before Jesus came to the earth and died on the cross? What about their sin? How can their sin be atoned for? And he deals with this in the rest of verse 25 and 26. Look what he says. This sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice, shows that God was being fair when He held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For He was looking ahead and including them in what He would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate His righteousness 
For He Himself is fair and just, and He makes sinners right in His sight when they believe in Jesus. You see, what Paul is saying is, God always deals fairly with every human being. And all the people before Christ, He dealt fairly with, starting with Adam and Eve. I mean, when Adam and Eve sinned and they were naked, their sin was exposed. What did God do for them? He killed an animal and clothed them with that animal skin. And it was an act of not punishing them then and there for what they deserved, but it allowed for that to go forward. And you see the first inklings of the Gospel in Genesis 3.15 (coughs) where God declares that He will strike Satan for what He has done by deceiving the man and woman. And so throughout history, God was dealing with sinful humanity based on their response to the revealed revelation that they had. Whether it was general revelation, which He dealt with in chapter 1, or it was the law that He gave to the Jews in chapter 2 and part of chapter 3. And all of that was merely a type showing, the law was just a merely a type showing that the true sacrifice would come to pass. And based on the revelation that somebody had and how they handled it, God dealt with them righteously and many in the Old Testament were saved because they trusted in God's provision at that time with the revelation that they had before Christ came. Paul now concludes this passage by again addressing those who would somehow have pride in who they are and what they've done, even in becoming a Christian. Look what he says in verse 27 and 28. Can we boast then that we've done anything to be accepted by God? No. Because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law, it is based on faith. And again, what? so we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. Again, Paul is specifically addressing those who were under the law, the Jews. But it applies to all of us who have accepted Christ as our Savior. In this, we are made right with God through faith, by obeying the, not by obeying the law. Martin Luther, when he was translating the Bible into German, He added a word here. Now we're not supposed to add to Scripture. Do you know what he added? Go back one one, uh, slide there if you can. It is based on faith. You know what word he put in there? Alone. Which doesn't do anything but amplify what Paul is saying here which became the cry of the Reformation, solo fide, we are saved by faith alone. And this is true for everyone who believes in Christ. Francis Schaeffer said this about our faith. Because I think it's important for us to understand our faith is not what saves us. Look at what he says. Our faith has no saving value. Our religious good works, our moral good works, have no saving value because they're not perfect. Our suffering has no value. The only thing in all of the universe that has the power to save is the finished work of Jesus. Our faith merely accepts that gift. And God justifies those who believe. So we are saved by faith alone, but it's God's work that saves us. We haven't, nor ever will be able to gain any merit with God based on our own efforts, not even our faith, but only in Jesus Christ's death on the cross for our sin. Any person 
who says they have done anything to contribute to their own salvation does not truly understand the gospel. And I go back to the man I talked to earlier this week. He claimed to be a Christian, but he wasn't fully trusting in Christ alone for salvation. It is sola fide, by faith alone, that we are saved. Paul addresses the Jews one more time in regarding their boasting in the next verses. Look at what he says. After all, is God the God of the Jews only? There were Jews who would argue that. Isn't He also the God of the Gentiles? Of course He is. There is only one God, and He makes people right with Himself only by faith, whether they're Jews or Gentiles. Again, Paul had gone into great detail to show that God does not distinguish between the Gentiles and the Jews because they're all sinners. He now concludes that God doesn't make any distinction between people based on whether they're Jew or not because salvation is freely offered to all people regardless of their heritage. Paul began chapter 3 by saying that the Jews were given great benefit because they had the law. He then stated in verse 20 where we started tonight that based on that knowledge, it did not really help them. For no one can be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us that we are sinful. Paul concludes chapter 3 with one more clarifying statement regarding the law in verse 31. He says, Well then, if we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. Paul has taught us that the law shows us that we're sinners. And he also has shown us that faith in Jesus Christ's death as a substitute for our sin is the only possibility to fulfill the law and make us right with God. The law also shows that God's righteousness has not been compromised because Jesus pays the just penalty for sins. So God's perfect law is perfectly and completely and thoroughly fulfilled through Jesus Christ's death as a substitute for the punishment of our sin. Our part is to believe. And that's not something we can ever boast about. We can only boast about what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Paul says this clearly in another one of his letters. Look what he said in Ephesians chapter 8, 2, verses 8 and 9. God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. The redemptive work of Christ is the most wonderful event in the history of the universe. Paul has given us a full understanding of why this is so. And that is why I started out by quoting scholars and I want to quote them again with what they had to say regarding this passage of Scripture. It is generally acknowledged to be the most theologically important segment of the entire New Testament. If we miss this, we miss the Bible. If we don't get salvation right, it doesn't matter about anything else. And that's why Robert Muntz or Leon Moore said, it may possibly, and I would add to this, it probably is the most single important paragraph ever written. The only ones that you could compare it with are the other passages throughout the New Testament uh, 
that talk about how God redeems us through salvation. And why this is so important is that when we trust in Christ's substitute, His substitutionary death for our sins, it fully satisfies God's righteous wrath against us. Because without Christ, we remain under the wrath of God. And we will be punished for our sins. But when Christ went to the cross and He died for us, our sins were fully atoned for. Everything necessary for us to be in a right relationship with God took place the moment Jesus said, it is finished. And that was what was finished. God's wrath against humanity was completed. But our part is that that only becomes a reality for us when we trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone to take the punishment for our sin. And I think that is in part why we need to be reminded of that every time we gather and we celebrate the Lord's table together. Because it is only through Jesus' blood, Jesus' death, that we have a right relationship with God and we are invited to His table. So if you would come forward and get the elements, and we're going to close our service right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who they are. This is true for the murderer, the drug addict, the adulterer. It's true for everyone regardless of who they are or what they've done. And that is the glorious message of the Gospel. There is nothing, there is no sin that I could commit that couldn't be forgiven by our wonderful Savior because Jesus died for every act of rebellion against God, which is every sin that has ever been committed by humanity. And we are made right with God. God's wrath is turned away. It is taken care of when we trust in Jesus. And Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper the night before He was crucified, just before He was arrested. He said, when you eat this bread, you remember my body that took your place and died for you. Let's eat. And when you drink this cup, it is the cup of the new covenant. The old covenant is abolished. It is obsolete. It wasn't good enough. This covenant makes us pure before God. It makes us right before God. And we are justified when we believe. Let's drink together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we are made right with You because of the blood of Jesus and not anything that we could do because we could never measure up. It would be like reaching, trying to reach a star. And if we could, we would be instantly burned up. And Father, that is a great illustration of Your holiness and Your righteousness. That You are so far beyond us that we could never reach us in our own effort. But You chose to send Your Son. Jesus, You became one of us and died our death so that we could be in relationship with You and we can live with You forever. What a glorious, wonderful Gospel. And Lord, may it impact every decision, every thought, every moment of our lives for the very rest of our lives. That Lord, we would glorify You and worship You
not just here on this earth, but for all of eternity. Because, Lord, we will be with you forever in your presence. And we are so grateful for that. And we pray this in your wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. And that brings us to our benediction. And it's why we can say this, is because Jesus has taken everything we needed. So let's close with standing and saying our benediction together. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. And we will see you next week.